Good evening and welcome back to Teatro Yamo for the second episode of Passion for Words with Peter Nyberg. We've spent a week in Sweden at the Dylan Thomas International Residency and last Monday you met three of our writers. This Monday you're going to re meet another three. Uh, this evening I'd like to introduce Tishani Doshi. Tishani Doshi um, we was born in India. Tishani first published a collection of poetry called Countries of the Body in 2006, which was awarded the Forward Prize for, for first collection. In 2010, she published her first novel, uh, which was shortlisted for the Orange Prize. And in 2013, she has two works uh, published. The, the first is a collection of poetry called Everything Be Begins Elsewhere. And the second was a retelling of a Welsh legend. Uh, the, the, the novel is called Fountainville mm -hmm. and is based upon the retelling of the story of Owain. Uh, the story of Owain is one of three romances linked to the Mabinogion and features in both the, the Red Book of Hiragest and the White Book of Brothock. But that's probably enough medieval Welsh literature for, for you this evening. Uh, we won't go any further. Um, <laughs> But a contemporary Welsh poet is Anthony Jones. Anthony Jones has, has joined us from Wales. In 2010, Anthony established a spoken word event in, in Carmarthen called Poems and Pints, which has been probably the longest running regular event in West Wales since then. He's also a founder member of Right for Word and has worked between Ireland and Wales, both giving readings and workshops and has been published in Ireland by Tara Press and in Wales by Parthian Press. And then Michelle. <laughs> we, we come to Michelle. Michelle Dooley-Marne is um, both vociferous and prolific in, in the new writing of the 21st century, in blogging and online. Uh, Michelle has two significant blogs. One is Shelley Pukki blogspot.com. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> and, the, and the other is uh, Michelle being the, the, the voice, the complete voice of the Alzheimer's uh, Association of Ireland. Um, you will you'll hear more of, of Michelle's work as the evening goes on, but I'd just like to think in terms of uh, social media, if you're both prolific and vociferous, you're almost promiscuous in a literary sense. <laughs> I don't know um, how Michelle feels about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to your host for this evening, the Editor-in-Chief of Popular Poesy, Peter Nyberg. First of all, I'm a bit curious. You have been here for a week. Uh, what have you experienced of Sweden? Is that just for, for me? Yeah. Um, I've loved it. I've loved Sweden. I've loved it since I landed. Uh, I travelled with a rather outrageously large case with broken wheels. So uh, my first experience was running through a crowd of very mild-mannered, middle-class uh, Swedish people in Stockholm Airport uh, trying to catch one of four trains. Uh, but I've loved it. I've loved meeting people. I've loved the weather. I have not loved the Bernays sauce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've discovered that the, the beer is expensive and the cigarettes are cheap. Um, oh. the, the people are incredibly friendly. I think it's a really open and relaxed society. Um, I, I feel no sense of danger here. Um, I do in my own hometown. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I do. And it, it's really nice to be wandering around um, anonymously and, you know, really you know, taking it all in. I think it's a, a really lovely night. Um, we spent last night on um, Torpen Island, uh, where I described it as the perfect wedding party. There were all generations um, coming together and dancing together and drinking together and having just a great time and squeezing every drop of sunshine because you need yeah. it, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm just very glad that we came to a smaller town like Tronos because it really gives us the chance to get to know it intimately. We don't have very long. 
And I think I've, I've sort of wrote about it this morning. I feel like we're, you know, in under Milkwood, our own version of walking around at night because of these wonderful bright nights. And thanks to Michelle, who talks to everybody she meets, we get to, you know, get to know about the people and what they think and having conversations and joking around. And it's, it's a great way to enter a culture and to have also... I guess fellow writers, comrades, whatever, mm -hmm. to to you know walk the streets with you. So we've we've been having a grand time. Yeah. What kind of writing have you done so far? Um, I've I've um, I've been quite <coughs> prolific for me. Um, I finished the poem I've been working on for an hour, uh, for a year and a half, and I've I've actually um, written three brand new poems. So that, that for me in a week is is quite really really productive. And I think it's only the space that we've been allowed to have and the time that we've been allowed to have that's given us that atmosphere of, of creativity. You know, we're all at it. We're, everybody's just dis disappearing into their rooms all the time or, or quiet spaces. There are so many things that go on in that Cultivarat building. The do some of these doors, we don't know what happens until suddenly a sound erupts and there's a music, you know, punk band playing beneath you and you're feeling it through your feet in the floorboards. It's extraordinary. Mine, I've done a number of blogs and because I'm in a house full of poets, uh, I've by osmosis almost started to begin to write poetry. Once by accident from my dear delicious friend here, Bient Björkland, who tried to choke himself to death on a piece of stickling and kickling and despite his best attempts to, uh, to die, uh, has been brought back from the dead <laughs> and so I, I wrote that I'm also writing a poem at the moment called uh, Late Sky Blue about the uh, the light here mm. and the lateness of the mm. light and I'm also writing a letter to the King of Sweden mm. uh, to talk to him about Tronos and to talk to him about Sweden and so I've been researching the King his life, his wife, his cars and, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm loving uh, uh, sending a letter to dear King Ralph uh, and other than that I'm Ralph. working uh, Carl yeah. <laughs> Ralph. Carl Ralph. It'll get the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, I just get my coat. Uh, no, there's a Ralph in there somewhere, I swear, because I checked every single name he has. Uh, and I'm writing a short story as well about being present in Sweden at this time. Yeah, well, I came with very noble intentions to work on my novel which is in a one-third stage and uh, has been left abandoned for a long time. But because I'm in a house of poets and I'm a poet primarily, I'm writing poems and writing a few essays and little bits of journalism. And um, mainly, I think it's also collecting material for things that I will write after mm. leaving Sweden. Yeah. Um, it's, very, it's a great gift to have for a writer to have a space and a room that's yours and that quiet, and so it's. Um, we'll see what happens. May I, may I add to that? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, I've been writing down notes like artists might uh, make preliminary sketches. Um, so even though you know I might not write a lot of poetry here, I think I've got quite a lot of ideas to go home and you know get you know down to writing about. Yeah, I think you know, it's going to it's going to lead on to more. Is that the same for you? Absolutely, because I think <coughs> authors, they absorb uh, their surroundings and we process information after the fact. Mm. I'm very observational in that I spot things, I like to hear sounds, I ask people to repeat themselves, I want to know how the word is spelt, say it to me phonetically, let me hear it again. Uh, so instead of running upstairs and writing something, I am literally living the life that I will then write later. So I'm looking forward to a massive Swedish outburst when I get back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, how did you begin to write and why did you begin to write? I, I, I'll, I'll go, I guess. Mm. Um, well, I, I think I've always written, I've always liked words, I've always, you know, been interested in letters. I used to write a lot of letters as a teenager, but I think I was in university when I decided that I wanted to be a poet, which was a very bold decision to arrive at, especially because I'd been studying business administration while I made the decision that I was going to leave all that and become a poet. And I think it was actually one of the best things that happened because I'd never 
known what I wanted to do before until that moment. And ever since then, I've been figuring out how to live as a poet because it's not easy. But at least I have one part of it covered, which is that this is what I want to do and that's what my life is going to be about. So I don't know if that's that answers your question. Yes, actually. <laughs> um, when, when I was a, a, a teenager, I was very lucky because I was very bored of music at the time and, and punk rock came along. And I wasn't much of a musician, although I did mess about with bands. Uh, but there were things, uh, people who were known as punk poets, who put out, uh, you, know, you might know the name of John Cooper Clark, he's a very famous punk poet of, his, of that generation. And at the time I um, put out a sort of limited edition, um, um, a, hun a hundred edition self-published work of, um, of uh, poetry called Putrid Poems. Um, and then uh, my... Life went elsewhere, like Tishani's. Um, I, I did a science degree, as my first degree, and then I got a really boring job in a, in a um, Nielsen, the, the, the place where the books get registered with now, if only they had them then, and then into the civil service. So it was only after I was retired through ill health through the civil service that I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And in Kamalian, where I come from, um, um, the adult education program were putting on a series of creative writing workshops and from there I was uh, then compelled to write and then I applied for a master's in our local university and now I call myself a writer and by default actually a poet. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I started writing when I was a child, uh, short stories, uh, keeping diaries and uh, just generally submitting things to competitions and um, then I got a job working on a newspaper called The Boker and myself and another lunatic, uh, a gentleman, a brother of Declan Sinnott, the musician from Horse Lips. We ran a, po uh, a paper called The Boker Gazette. We wrote all of it. We wrote the problem pages, we wrote the <laughs> recipes, uh, we sold the ads. And so after that, then I moved. I've had many, many lives and careers. I moved to Germany and would submit my copy by uh, airmail. And after that, I, I was writing for a long time, but only stuff that people didn't really see. So the reason that I have the audience I do now is I started writing about my mother and her illness. My mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's uh, nine years ago even though it had been manifest for about 18 months before. Mm. And as a family, we were aware. And my father was, in fact, complicit in, in, in trying to hide it. Mm. And I think people do. I think people think, oh, we mustn't show this and we mustn't. There was such a stigma. And so she's resident in a nursing home now and has morphed from uh, a lady uh, walking and talking and eating into somebody uh, completely dependent, it's almost like locked-in syndrome, and she's in the corner of a massive, massive chair, I call the Stephen Hawking chair, mm. and she resembles him in the corner of it, and so she's spoon-fed in a nappy, and mm. it's horrific, it's horrific to watch, it's horrific to deal with, so I started to come home and vent that, just line by line, just to an, you know, to a very tiny audience, and then people, because it was so honest and, and really warts and all it was the implosion of a family as the dynamic changed completely so people started reading that and sharing it and then it was going tweeted and shared and retweeted i'd like to thank the swedish fly and ask him <laughs> when did he start writing uh, so i uh, <laughs> Uh, I started getting an audience from that who realised that the girl writing the funny stuff or the observational or the very honest accounts of of stuff uh, was writing very sad stuff about her mother. Mm. So that's really where the online audience took off. Do you have a crossover where your where your where your Alzheimer's sort of sadness be, melts into your comedy? I mean, yes, do you, do you write, absolutely, write, because it's quite shocking. I think what the illness has done has showed me that life is very temporary mm. and that tempest fugit and seize the day and mm. do it now. And it has also made me a little jaded, a little cynical. I was a very um, light-hearted, oh, yes, everything's beautiful and wonderful. This has really been eye-opening and it has it has made, made me from the childish way I was, be a little more cynical about things. And so when I deliver a performance now, I can be ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, and then suddenly I'll just throw in a line that they'll go, what? What did she say? And then there'll be silence and then people will cry and then instantly people are laughing again. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite a roller coaster of emotions, you know, that people feel. So, 
I'm also working on two books. I'm, I've written uh, a book about uh, a resident of, of my hometown, and um, I'm writing a book called Mother's Day, uh, parsing the memories of my mother that she's no longer able to communicate and remembering a childhood born in the 60s in Ireland, almost like very like the Sweden I'm in now, which seems to me to be a beautiful nostalgic space where people, the cycle paths are bigger than the than mm. the roadways. People are very lovely and kind. Ireland, although it's a land of saints and scholars and is supposed to be this beautiful green paradise, is a busy, busy, crazy place. And so to recall that, people couldn't get enough of it. So I'm writing that and it's called Mother's Day. And I'm also writing a story about some of the tamer events of my life. And that's called Shell Shock. Your life is obviously pretty close to what you're writing. How about you? Are your life well connected mm. to I, writing? I, 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 I have no imagination. I can only write from experience. There's no novel <laughs> in me. Um, I, uh, you're, you're, it is interesting to hear that you're down into breaking down stigma. Um, th I said I was pensioned out of the civil service. That was because of my bipolar disorder. I just got to the state where I, I wasn't reliable to turn up anymore. And um, one of the things that I do write about extensively is um, is, is uh, mental illness. And um, uh, I, th I think that if I have <laughs> any gift at all, then I, I, I've got a responsibility to to write about that. Um, but that needn't necessarily be in a heavy way either. There's a lot of levity in mania. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question because I think there's a big divide between fiction and non-fiction. I think people really, when they read now, a lot of people want to read something that's truthful, they want to know something, um, have knowledge and information, that's the age that we live in. But I'm a little of the idea that fiction has great redeeming qualities mm -hmm. and that life for all its wonder and for all that you can never make up anything mad as real life i think the imagination and the universe of a fiction writer to create their own world to make their own people to invest them with a code and a mythology and ideas i mean that's where i go to to novels for that to understand about the human condition and to understand i guess you know, the idea of there being many levels of truth and to create that other truth, which is not just what we live in our daily lives. Mm. But I'm also very, very close to my experiences and what I live. And many of my poems and my all of my fiction always comes from something real. So I always take an image or an idea or a conversation or a character, <coughs> but it's not about reporting or capturing that real thing. It's about making it something else, something bigger than that or something altered <coughs> than that. And it's quite the task. And uh, one of my favorite writers is a Canadian writer, Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. And she had a wonderful quote about this. And someone asked her, you know, is your writing autobiographical? Because every fiction writer gets asked this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, God, just shoot me, you know. <laughs> and she said this great thing about, you know, there has to be a little bit of, little bit of blood in the gingerbread man for him to come alive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we do. We put ourselves and we try to make it alive in whatever way, whether it's memoir or poetry or fiction, but that what we present is is trying to get other people to connect to it and to emote. So, Is that a good advice for uh, young people who want to write, who want to be a writer, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. connect their lives to the writing and mm -hmm. to write think, about things they know? I think write what you know is a bit of a cliche, but there's nothing wrong with no. that. Um, I, I, I just I just say to any young person, just write and write yeah. and write. And I say read and yeah. read and yeah. read <laughs> before you write and write and write. Yeah. Because reading is, is everything. If you don't read, then you can't mm. write. I think it's just, mm. it's, uh, people are always wanting to you know imagine themselves as being poets and they don't mm. buy books of poetry, they no. don't read poetry and it's like, okay, why do you think someone wants to read your poetry, mm. do you know? And I think that reading is absolutely the most important thing for a young writer is yeah. to... And I, and I, I do think that, uh, that, um, that I, I do think that writing classes are good things. I mean, a lot of people don't, but I don't see why that should be so. 
And if you get any opportunity to go to any writing class at any time, just go. And I would say don't be afraid of the white space. Mm. Make the mark. Sometimes if you have a blank page or if you have a blank screen or a canvas, whatever it is, there can be a lot of second guessing and thinking, what the light? Don't even know. Don't be, make a mark. Write anything, even if it's just words or an alphabet or just flicking paint onto a can. Mark it, claim it. Once you claim the space, then you have no option but to inhabit it. Mm-hmm. Somebody liked that. Mm-hmm. He was going to write that as a poem tonight. I, I know you. Can't take that in there. Claim the space. <laughs> now we're going to hear a little bit of poetry. Okay. Um, I'll read a small poem, which is um, from this collection. It's called Lesson in Stillness. All morning, I tried to hold it, the desperation of a fly beating against glass, a dog's distant bark, the dull throb of a lorry winding its way up the hills. By afternoon, I think I've mastered it. Nothing the world offers me can be as complete or as full as this. When I step into the light. I have no song for the stones, no thought for the grass. I only want to remember this long road, this steady pulse which feels like love. So when evening feeds itself tonight, clearing the way for frost or flood, I'll still be left with this, the bright suffocation of flowers, the weight of the days, hours. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you are all three very sophisticated uh, readers, spoken word artists. You, you are very good at pronouncing your poems. Uh, do you write in an audience in mind? Um, though, though if, 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 you were here, if you were there in the, the, the library, um, the, um, at the, the, the poetry slam we had the other night, uh, all I brought were three, the three performance poems I have. Uh, no, I don't. I don't write with a performance in mind at all, I'm afraid. No, oh, I, I, with I, an audience? An audience, I'm audience. sorry. No, uh, no, I write for myself, I'm afraid. And um, if people like it, then that's good. And if they don't, then that's fine too. Mm. If you're, not happy, if you're not happy with what you, what you write for yourself, then yeah. you can't impose it on anybody else. It's, it's hard because I think there is always an idea that there is an audience because as a writer you want to have an audience. Mm. You're not keeping a journal to keep for your grandchildren or, you know, it is to get it out there. But I think also the idea of an audience can be, um, it can be too imposing and it can censor, you can censor yourself while writing. You know, so sometimes when I, all I, I don't even have to think about an audience, I just think about my mother and I think, oh, can I write this? <laughs> Is it okay for me to, you know, and I think as a writer, you have to just forget about everything and forget about how your family is going to take it or how your friend or, and, and just write what you need to write and hope that you will create your own audience. And I think that's what I've been trying to do. But definitely there is, it just, it's a faceless audience for me. It's, a, it's just, you know, more, mostly I'm thinking about not, yeah, not, not being hampered by the idea of, of like I said, an aunt or, you know, mm. uh, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, this would shock my mum, yeah. Well, I didn't write for any audience at all in the beginning because I uh, did never, ever thought I'd be performing. Uh, these innermost thoughts and these observations and this very, very honest account of both my mother, Siobhan, and the other parts of my life, crazy things. Uh, I've had many jobs. Um, One of the pieces I write called uh, Stranger on a Bus is about an elective muted Dutch guy who lived with me for four and a half years and who just spoke the same sentence every night and how a man tried to hang himself with his belt. No, he survived, we, we rescued him. And it's actually a comedy piece. So if you can believe that, that the, that's, they fall around the room laughing at this one, uh, even though it's about a suicide attempt. And so these to me were just recalling uh, things uh, because one of the shows I did was called Before I Forget. 
again tying in with Alzheimer and memory loss and the loss of a person. So when I started writing the things I never thought anybody would ever read them, let alone hear me deliver them. And that's where the internet and, and social media, although many people uh, consider it to be um, invasive or ridiculous, my father, my 84-year-old father goes, don't be putting things about me up on your blob. <laughs> <laughs> so I would cop on. And so uh, he, I never realised. So I would come in, I would come in from visiting her or I would come in from living one of the many multi of things I do in a day and just be like this ch -ch 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 -ch. and then suddenly somebody made the mistake of saying come out and do it for us come out and let the people see you let them hear you and deliver it so the night I turned up I see this crowd outside and I was like this Who are, who's in here and they went oh there she is so when I realised then that it was you know, it isn't a solitary pursuit people are reading it and that it touches people everywhere you know, so it was never written for an audience or for performance, but it has worked out like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you know you have an audience, an internet way you can uh, actually talk to the writer. Does that change? Of course, the way it does. I'm you, outrageous you now. I'm outrageous. <laughs> yeah, they've created a monster. You know, I'm wearing a hat and a Woodstock dress at six o'clock in the evening in Sweden. I'm working out. You know, this was the girl who lived alone at home in a cardigan with egg on it and a chihuahua and a full of ash and a cigarette. And now I'm coming in going, hold my bag, please. <laughs> so, of course, it, it has changed it. And what's lovely is that people like it. They like what I do. They respond to it. They react to it. So um, I just hope I can keep cruising and not be killed. Yeah. <laughs> How do you come in contact with your audience? Oh, um, in random bars. Yeah, <laughs> random bars. I just I just walk around bars <laughs> and impose my poetry on everyone. No, um, I, I, we we've we've got a very very good. Um, um, uh, we, Dom introduced me by saying that I'd started up this thing called Poems and Pints uh, in the, the county town of Carmarthen, Carmarthenshire. Uh, but, but as a result of that, as a consequence of that, I'm, I, we're both proud to say because Dom does himself his favour because um, although it was my creation and I do a lot of the organisation for it, uh, Dom is the, he um, MCs every event. And he's, um, we've had international people performing at our events and they all say he's the best. I'm, I'm sure that anybody who's seen him so far <coughs> will, will confirm that. Um, but um, so, so as a, as a great consequence of, of, of poems and pints, we've now got um, I think it's four or even five now uh, separate gr groups based on our model, which has started up in our area. So in, in a, any given month, I, I can go and perform my work if I choose to. I might not. I might not have anything new. I might not have anything to say. But I can. Um, I can go to any one of those events. I know that I can perform those, so that, so that those there. It's great to have the opportunity to perform, perform events. Um, we, like I said, I've been to Wexford a few times, and um, and it's it's great to have the opportunity <coughs> to to perform perform my work to a wider audience. And um, I'll I'll be you know delighted to do that here tonight and in subsequent events for the rest of the week, and we'll <coughs> take things from here. Well. Um yeah, I have a, a bit of a conflicting relationship with the the new role of the writer, <coughs> which is to engage. Mm. Um, never used to be like that. You wrote books. Books are wonderful objects. They are a utterly private act. Mm. I take someone's book, I read it. I'm having a conversation with the author. It's I don't need to meet the author. I don't need to know what's your favorite food or anything like that. But now it's not like that. Now you go, you perform, you have to be funny, you have to be clever, you have to be witty, you have to do, and you have to write books. So, but you know, and a lot of writers are okay with it and a lot aren't and they don't and they just, you know, I think it's it's a changing world and we pick our, we pick the thing that works for us. So. Uh, there is um, there is a thing of great intimacy on the internet, which I find very scary personally. So I try to stay away from it. But I have a website, I have email, I can get in touch. I go to literary festivals, I meet audiences across the world, I meet other writers, which I love meeting other writers because you know, I work in a small village and I don't know any other writers there. 
But in terms of that constant availability to answer to things, to be available, I think it's such a personal choice. Mm. And for me, it's too much distraction. It's too much work. It's too mm. much not space enough in my head to then go and try to create my own like world that I'm working on. Yeah. You know, and I think it's 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 going to be very interesting to see how the roles change because I think it's demanding more and more of us to engage, to come out, and and we'll see what happens in ten years. You Tish, know? Tishani and I were talking about this on the way over the the the, the conflict of being you know, being a writer is is a very solitary process. It's something you do on your own in a space where you feel good, mm-hmm. and then you know the the if you want to perform it or, or, or the need to perform it comes in, then it takes a t- totally different kind of um, discipline. And, um, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you say. It, 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 is, it is changing and uh, it is a demanding world. And would you want to be Salinger or would you want to be Tish? Uh, uh, would you want to be Michelle? <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to look like Tish. I think... I mean, Salinger could afford to be Salinger, is the point, you know. I mean, some yeah. writers, Thomas Pynchon or whatever, there yeah. are so many writers who just say, well, I'm going to keep my anonymity. You don't need to know what I look mm. like. I'm going to just sit here, write my books, and millions of people are going to buy them. Mm. Good for them. Mm. For the rest of us who don't have that audience, it's really this thing of, oh, yes, I want to um, be out there in some way, but do I need to be utterly available mm. be uh, like have um, you know how do you protect your your privacy mm. how do you protect yourself which is i think a very important thing when I, you're right I, I think in the end i suppose that that really is up to you isn't it it's up of to course you. Yeah. and that's the thing is i'm saying you find your balance you know and some people can very happily go online do all their things and still retain don't feel eroded from the experience and other people's have other people have different experience i have to mm. say that of this, this this week, the last week that's just gone by, I've posted more on Facebook than I ever have. Well, <laughs> it's because we're all doing it. <laughs> do, do you think you take a role in media? Do you, you are the bright the writer, Anthony Jones, or the writer, mm-hmm. Tishani, or are you entirely yourself? So that's a really hard question to ask. Answer. Um, I don't know how to answer that. I, th- I think my, I think uh, at this stage in my writing career, anyway, uh, uh, I bow to uh, Tishani. I bow to Michelle. Uh, I'm totally Anthony Jones. Yeah. I'm a combination. I'm a public persona, and I'm also a writer. And uh, somebody had a question for me once where they said, "Do you know? Or should we know about this? And we know about this." And I said, "Yeah, but you only know what I want you to know. Yeah. Because even though it appears that I go, look at this, look at this, look at this, look what I did now. I'm only drip feeding the pri, you know, only so much of the stuff. I mean, my father, I've mentioned him already, uh, was coming to the things like this, going, oh, gee." what is she going to say and then I, I, I he was I was here and he was just to my left and I was conscious of this presence <laughs> of him like this <laughs> and uh, nervous he was very nervous for me as well but also secretly proud and then I realized you know when you can just catch somebody uh, in your peripheral vision I realized he was laughing out loud and I went god it nailed it done and so that was it as well it was almost validation for the writing because it doesn't matter how many people read it and like it how many people from Wisconsin go oh that's perfectly wonderful but it's if you can tap into your octogenarian father and he doesn't actually want to uh, crucify you after it then you know you've done something okay so I, I do feel I'm too I'm too <coughs> persona I'm a very I'm an extroverted introvert you know very much so yeah <coughs> Yeah. What was the question? Well, what was the question? What were you saying again? <laughs> Who are you? Uh, <laughs> What's oh, oh, I, I, we, we can go. Tish, you tish? <laughs> no, of course, because you, 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 you present. I mean, you, you are presented in a way, and you, you write books. You, you, you are a writer. I also dance, and I think that is the thing that saved me, because I do not like to be kept in a in the that's what you are kind of thing. Indian writer 
mm. whatever, you know, that, yeah. that thing. So uh, when I was in my mid-twenties, I started to dance. I had this alternative career, which I never dreamt of. And it was all because I met a wonderful woman who was 50 years older than me and just said, come and dance. And it was basically saying, come and have an adventure with me. And I said, okay, because I had nothing else to do. And she was beautiful. And I sort of was in just love with the idea of her and her life. And then until she died, I was a dancer. And that having that ability to to have both worlds made me realize that actually, yeah, that's what I'm comfortable with, having this duality. I'm, I'm Welsh, I'm Indian. I, I don't like just being the one thing because I think if it gets too much, you can always go on the other. You know, writing is very, very difficult. I found it, especially when you're starting out find a publisher, find an agent to get, you know, there's a thin line between sort of wannabe writer, published writer, how do you, mm. how do you get there, you know, and, and you feel embarrassed to say, well, I'm a writer, but, you know, just sort of writing my book, and <laughs> kind of nobody <laughs> publishing me, and I want, you know, and I think, um, I think that's been very important to, to, to understand that also there are many possibilities, and you don't have to, you know, I write prose and poetry, so it's it's always this duality, and I guess it's also the duality of I'm me and I'm I'm that person as well. Yeah. We have to hear a little bit more poetry. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, well, if I may, I'm, I'm going to read two poems. Um, one is um, incredibly Welsh. It's got so many Welsh references in it. There's no point in explaining them all. Um, I'm, only, I'm unapologetically sentimental in some of my writing, and um, I do write an awful lot of uh, breakup poems. So what that says about me, I don't know. <laughs> but this one's just called Bread Poem. <clears throat> As a gesture to my Welshness, she brought a loaf of bread from St Fagan's Folk Museum, transferred crust by crust from the ruins of an abandoned bakery cellar in Troy de Fru. So we toasted our love on Buckley's Best Bitter and Brains S.A. and the best Welsh whisky of Pindarin. We feasted on lava bread and cockles, butter breath and cowl with leeks and lamb. In springtime, we would walk through Brechwa Forest, laughing and kissing and loving on a bed of daffodils. But winter came on all too soon and all my love was spent. And now, my darling, all that I can offer you are crumbs. Um, this one is a very new poem. I wrote this sort of thing off. I finished this on the second day I was here. Um, you'll, you'll get it. It's called Bird Song in Sweden. <clears throat> I have taken birds for granted all my life. And now I have migrated north to summer in Scandinavia. I notice when the whistling wind, which rustles and whispers gently through the sleeping, weeping willow, takes a breath, when the boisterous blare of a passing, roaring freight train fades away and there is silence, I notice. The insidious bird song perches uneasily on my ear. This is not the summer soundtrack I am used to. It is different and discordant and sounds all wrong. As alien to me as I am alien to Tranos in Sweden, I see these birds and I am the imposter. We never see these birds at home, and I notice. I can name some, a lapwing maybe, or a peewit, but I miss the blackbirds and the thrushes and the pigeons. And, there's a sol and there, there is a solitary magpie who flits before me as if to say, Good morning. Hello, friend. You're welcome. <laughs> How do uh, writing projects start for you? For me? For, for Ryan? Or no? <laughs> for me, my process is, it, it usually comes with an idea, which is followed by um, a line, probably, or maybe a couplet. And then um, nothing gets on the page for maybe even a month. And it's just played over while I'm washing up, while I'm watching telly, when, whatever I'm doing, it's in my head. Mm -hmm. It's constant and it won't go away. And then... I put my first draft on paper, never on screen, first of all, never on the computer. Uh, it's one of the, the tips from Simon Armitage. Mm -hmm. It's because if you start writing on a computer, it looks like a form of poem already. Mm -hmm. 
And your first draft, I don't believe, I, I would never prescribe, but I think that um, it, I, the way I work anyway is it, it's always on paper. And then I work on that and I work on that and I, I do it on a big A4 piece of you know, pad and I'm always making alterations and cutting out chunks and rearranging them and cutting and pasting essentially. But um, then the first draft goes on and then I may work on that. And then quite often I send it to somebody I've never once, I don't think, read or had anything published that hasn't be, been through somebody first. Maybe that's the confidence of my own voice, maybe not, but you know, it, I, I've never ever given a piece of poem to, for someone to look at and they haven't made a suggested edit, whether then I t take the suggestion up or not. Mm -hmm. um, that's up to me, but you know, it's, uh, I think it's important to, to run it by someone anyway that you trust first. Dom is quite often a um, recipient of one of my poems. Yeah. Mine is different in that uh, mine comes from a memory or it might come from the sky or it might come from an overheard conversation uh, or a snatch of music, just something. And I never, although I have a notebook, multitudes of notebooks mm. and diaries, they're unopened, including the ones on my desk back in uh, the house, are unopened for this week. And I'm writing on just scraps. But what I do is I sit with the blank screen and go, go. And then I just type it. Uh, so that's how the initial thing, obviously, it ed I edit, didn't go back to it and save it and do it another day. But if it's um, if it's a blog post, I'll sit till 3, 4 a.m. and do my own photographs and then just press post and go to bed. Mm -hmm. And then I see, yeah, then I see how it plays out. And, you know, uh, sometimes that can work uh, brilliantly and sometimes... Uh, you can wake up and find a lot of sharing and tweeting and retweeting and those are great days, you know, because it means uh, it's like a stone cast into water. It has a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. So there's an immediacy to it that there isn't if um, you're writing or rewriting or editing or rewrite. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so but with the books that I'm doing, they're they're very much different than that. I had a memory stick to take over here. And of course, I couldn't find it. You forgot your memory stick. Yeah, the only thing with a memory in my house is the mattress. And uh, so I didn't bring the memory stick. And so now I'm up there. I just want to bash that typewriter off the wall. But uh, yeah, so I'll actually get back to that when I go back. But it's definitely, I'm very influenced by people, by random things. Even as Tishani was talking, I had this vision of her dancing with this beautiful, you know, and I'm going, there's, a bio, there's an in for me. That's a line for me to start something beautiful. Is an overheard, you know. I think I'm very image based. I, I I'm very visual as a person, and so I'm very moved by by an image. And usually, for me, a poem will start from an image, but also prose. Uh, and I like people and characters as well. And it's uh, you know there are poems that take many years to incubate before they arrive in the world and then their poems are just gifts that just come and they're there and you know it's done and those are great but you know <laughs> rare and uh, I think with prose for example uh, with my fo with my novel I spent seven years working on it before it got published I, and even when I sold it to the publisher, I still had to wait three years before it was on the shelf. And I was yeah. so impatient. It was so, I just thought, God, I got a publisher, publish my book and let it get out because I'm sick of it. You know, I'd written it four different times and four different ways, the same story in four different ways. And I just worked it, worked it. And I thought I have no more blood to give to this. <laughs> and my editor, my publisher, who's a very wise and wonderful woman, she just said, you know, this is your first book and we're gonna get it right. And it's not there yet. And I said, really? <laughs> okay, and, and how much can you work on something before it is acceptably right? For whom and how? And those are things that as a writer, you have to really um, negotiate. And it's wonderful to have actually a publisher that cares enough to edit, because I think nowadays, most people just want a finished, mm ready to go manuscript and that dialogue and communication of someone who you trust to say well you know what's happening here this is you know not working or whatever so it's 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 the lesson that i've learned is very much there's something about slowness and that if you can inhabit something for long enough you will arrive but at the same time you can't 
get stuck in it because it can also be an abyss, you know, and you just think creatively you can extinguish yourself on one thing. And so it's it's a bit of a balance between how much is long enough to yeah. spend with a poem or a book or anything. I'm a bit curious about your working day too. Uh, how much time do you lay on writing and uh, editing and working with your text? Um, well, I'm very schizophrenic, I think, as a writer because when I'm writing, I'm writing a lot and that's my life. I don't have, a, uh, I, I, I work as a freelance journalist and I, I have the dance group, but other than that, I don't have a job, I don't teach or anything, so I have writing is what I do. But then I take off a few months <coughs> and I don't write much, but I read and I'm like traveling and I think that's all like material gathering for me. I collect things and then I go back to my house and I sit and I write and then I'm like a hermit and so when I'm writing I'm very disciplined I uh, wake up early I like to walk I do yoga I'm, I'm kind of having this very you know structured life and when I'm living and I'm completely doing the other things because I think you have to live in order to write and I can't manage to do both at the same time <coughs> haven't figured it out no. so. <laughs> I think anybody has any How does working day? I've got no structure in my life at all, I'm afraid. I don't work at all. <laughs> um, I'm, I live on a government pension and benefits. Um, uh, if, if, if only I had structure. Um, really, uh, every day is different. Um, and um, as people in the house will know, I get up at different times. I go to bed at ridiculously late hours. Hopefully, I'll get better this week. But um, no, um, it's very good to have this space where... You know, I'm always compelled to work because I'm very lazy and if, if I didn't then, you know, I, I probably would just, you know, would just waste away in my life and not achieve anything. I kind of do um, a lot of different stuff on an average day, um, but I always find time to slot the writing in, but it's not my raison d'etre or the be all end all. I, I kind of function doing other things and it's almost ancillary you know and i have no discipline i literally uh, i'm like the song i eat when i'm hungry i drink when i'm dry mm. you know uh, i sleep whenever but if something needs to be done i'll stay up all night i've often still been typing uh when people are going to work in the morning i've typed all night or and then i'll sleep till lunch and everybody's like where are you get up what uh, I live this in a, what I call a TARDIS this tiny little terraced house with an attic and a little spiral stairs and every inch of it is filled with painting and writing and books I have to step over things it's 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 not a safe space for visitors but it's it's a lovely it's it's an eerie it's like a hermitage it's where all of the stuff goes on and then when I leave that and I go outside then I engage with people and I talk and eat and drink and work and but inside is where all of it happens so it was hard to transplant that uh, to craft work at to a writer's residency because I looked around this massive white space you could fit my whole house uh, floor space into the bedroom and I went I can't work like this it's too beautiful it's too white it's too clean it's too Swedish I have to <laughs> toss it around a bit and so that's why it, that room is filled with stuff mm -hmm. I have been like uh, cherry picking from every room there's statues cushions throws <laughs> candles uh, I've got my clock of you no, no. It's the clock. only thing I haven't got, okay. but I've everything else in the okay. house, uh, with permission, and it will all be left behind only because my suitcase is already bulging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now to another question: uh, Which other writers inspire you? Mm. Which you know, is your do, you know what, do you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna name any poets here. No, yes, I am. Of course, I am. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what. I, I think about our schooling. Okay, the, uh, the only formal education I've had in English literature was um, up to sixteen, and it was um, very, very formal. And very, um, the the curriculum that we had then was um, English writers. So being or being uh, uh, an English speaking Welshman or Welsh school boy, as I was then, um, our curriculum was um, Shakespeare, and we had... Um, who do we else we have? So I've, I've just frozen. Um, we had um, the, 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 the lyrical ballads, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, 
and um, we have, for God's sake, the Restoration uh, Theatre, you know, Sheridan, and thankfully we had T.S. Eliot, and that was the first time I could ever um, appreciate a modern poem. Mm. Uh, this was language I could understand. This is language that is spoken now. And that was the, fir- the, the, the love song of, of J. Alfred Pufar, was the, the first song, which, uh, the first poem which I could ever relate to. Uh, and um, it's got so, much, um, so many quotable lines in it. It's, um, you know, the, the very start, it's what a fantastic metaphor. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is set out uh, against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Um, and, 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 and that was what got me into reading poetry then. In the, in the current day curriculum, um, they have the aforementioned um, John Cooper Clark, living poet. They have Simon Armitage, who's a wonderful poet, a living poet. These guys go around to the schools and meet the children who are studying them. See what a difference the change has made in 40 years. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not really answering the question, but it's something I feel really passionate about. Um, you, you know, you, you, okay, I look back in Shakespeare now, and fine, of course I appreciate it, you're bound to. When I was a punk rocker, I dismissed Led Zeppelin. I didn't, yeah, you know, I love them now, you know, but um, you, you, you have to have something which you can relate to in order to inform you and inform your work. Yeah. Um, maybe you can bail me out here. <laughs> no, I mean, just to, to build on that, I mean, you know, the favourite writer or the writers that inspire you, they're changing on a day-to-hour mm. basis, yeah. and we are, to use your word, promiscuous about mm. language and what we read and we should be, that's only mm. right. But I, I, just to pick up on what Anthony said, I really feel this for poetry as well, and it's something that I've been trying to do, because the way that it's taught in most places, I don't know how it is in Sweden, but certainly it sounds like in England mm. now they're changing it up. Mm. When I was studying in India, we were studying, I mean, a lot of English. I mean, I thought poetry was written exclusively by dead white men. That's right. You, know? <laughs> and you couldn't write poetry unless you're dead, white, and a man, mm. because that's all we had. And then when I, I remember, I came across this Indian poet, Kamla Das, and she wrote about being a woman and menstrual and there was like you know sex and there was all this stuff and about society and it was now and it was and I thought oh my god is that allowed can you do that in poetry and it was it was really eye-opening and then I went to the states and again I read contemporary poetry there and I thought this is this is interesting that's why I became a poet because if I had not read any contemporary poetry I would you know, it's, it's, like mu- it's like a museum mm-hmm. of beautiful Absolutely. words, yeah. but no way for you to enter it, yeah. really. And I mean, growing up in India, we also have a very, like, colonized sort of syllabus. I, I grew up reading Inid Blyton, yeah. do you know? And it's like yeah. all ginger beer and yeah, yeah, jam yeah, 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 yeah. rolls and no and, idea and, what those things and, are, and really, but it sounds great, and you really know? Right-wing, really right-wing views. Yeah, you know, Johnny yeah. Foreigner, you yeah. know? But it's just that also, in, and, and you know, people say a lot of things about Indian Black, but I think actually it doesn't matter because it's the imagination mm. as well. And there was a wonderful imagination. But I think you do need to have your own representation. You do need to have your story at which you can enter and say, OK, I'm going to do my own version of this. And you need an entry point for that. And I think that's why it's so important that poets go to schools and poets read their work and, and, and present because it's like you you can be alive and now and here to write poetry and not, yeah. you know. As you do. Yeah. Yeah, yes. mine was, uh, I graduated from the Enid Blight and this was going back to your favourite, your favourite or your inspiring authors. Uh, I graduated from Enid Blight and the little uh, tiny children's books to reading Christy Brown down all the days mm. that I took from under my mother's mattress mm-hmm. and also Edna O'Brien the country oh. girls and oh. the girl with green eyes and they were all banned in Ireland this mm. was the early yeah. 70s they were banned but that lady who's still one of the most inspirational women in my life mm. had uh, had these books under her mattress and I used to take them very small upstairs to the room and go like this uh, and she only found out I was uh, reading them because I was marking the page. Yeah. So there was two marks, and she went like, "What? Is she reading this?" Uh, so that and my other favourite, uh, as a child, would would have been uh, Jerome K. Jerome, uh, Three Men in a Boat. Just the most beautiful, humorous, 
uh, thing about these three Victorian <coughs> gentlemen and the little dog on a, on a canal boat going up and down the Thames. And I reread it only recently and went, Christ, this is good and hilarious. And you know, so, but I think writers that really would have influenced me would have been O'Brien and would have been Christy Brown and a lot of Irish authors, of course, Joyce and Beckett. And um, it, recently, uh, I'm loving John O'Donoghue and uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you can't, uh, how could you leave out Sylvia Plath or, or, um, Catcher in the uh, Salinger, or, or do you know? They're like life changing, transformative mm. books. And yet, I think the art of reading, uh, I hope that in 40 years you could sit here and interview people and, they, and ask them about their author because I see the whole vision of books altering, you know, and yeah. the availability of them yeah. with the digital age and yeah, with indeed. the cost of. Of printing and mm. you know the, the transient nature of of people with goldfish memories who are just going show me what is the point show me there's the punchline right move on is anybody reading anymore yeah. is know, anybody yeah. buying books do, do you know if you know in 40 years time you could be sitting here instead of asking us what's our favorite novel you could be writing you could be asking what's your best video game ever yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I, I would hope that they're not mutually exclusive, <laughs> that you could have a favorite video game and a favorite novel. And just to not get pessimistic about the future of books, I want, we were talking about this in the car when I arrived, because I was at a festival on a panel with Karl Ove Kanausgaard, the Norwegian sensation, who's written six huge books about his life and people are reading them in the millions. I mean, it's a lot of time to read, mm -hmm. do you know, I haven't read them myself but I've met lots of people who've read them and told me about them and talked and I just I'm amazed and delighted that that kind of literary form that is very demanding and takes a lot of effort is still that the people are still able to enter that universe and that they still want it on some level and so I think that there is a there is a possibility for that. Do you think that the paper as material is important uh, or is it just something you read from. Actually, to me, it is. But uh, yeah. I, 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 I've known so many people who said, I, I, "I swear I'll never get a Kindle," or "I swear I'll never read off a tablet." I now know so many people who've converted already, and I think I think what will happen possibly is in the same way that um, you know people went to CDs and now MP3s, and now there's a vinyl uh, revival. Yeah. I think I think that might yeah. happen. I think there might be. Uh, yeah, we were only discussing know, that. Who holds on to books, everybody, because there might yeah. be market for them in ten years' time instead yeah. of Kindles and yeah. Amazons. I think they're not mutually exclusive no. again because mm -hmm. I am very sentimental about books and paper, and I, I the smell I of it. Reading is yeah. a sensory experience, and it's important. But at the same time. I do have an uh, iPad and I read a lot on it yeah. because I travel a lot really, and it's, yeah. it's just a, it's a convenience. Mm. Also, I live in a village and there's no bookstore within, you know, mm. I have to drive two hours. And so all I need is an internet connection. And if I read a review in a newspaper and think that sounds good. I just download it or download a sample to see if I like it and then I buy it. Mm. And if I really, really adore it, then I'll buy a copy and I'll have it on my shelf. But I think there is a case for books as objects. You know, Clive James, he said that, you know, he has all these books on his study and it's like osmosis. Even if you never read the book again, it's just like they're there yeah, passing you on know, something. You can go back to it. And I like that idea that books are, you're, you know, I've traveled, I've moved to three different countries and literally the only thing that's been constant have been my books that I've taken mm. with me, mm. and yeah. I, I'm I'm at home where my books are. So. I, I have to say, I've, I've read very few novels more than once. Yeah, mm. really. But it's it's more well, about I the fact back. that they're there, mm. you know. Again and again, they're like old friends. Mm. Yeah, you know, for sure. Time, Love time, them. time is short. There's too much out there. Yeah. <laughs> we all have to paint. Well, we are going to. End up with uh, you doing nothing. I'm doing nothing. Yeah. Doing what I am going tell to tell a story about Ben. I'll tell a quick thing. Uh, the reason I have no uh, material to read this evening is uh, uh, we've just come from an airport, dropping one of our colleagues back. And to cut a long story short, we were at the wrong airport uh, because <laughs> it was changed, and so it's been a mad dash back here. So the two things I had ready. 
Who's that waving our phone? They're filming you. Go on. Oh, okay. Oh, that's your that's your story. Your, your you chicken do story. Something? Oh. Oh, yeah. Mean? Maybe can I bring me my chicken story? I'll do the chicken story for you. Thank you so much. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I was going to say that. Uh, what's the place we are on Friday? Friday. Uh, you know Bantai. Where, the Bantai. The Bantai yes. I was going to say, if your audience uh, would like to come to the Bantai on Friday, I'll read the letter not to King Ralph, but to King Carl Gustav and Sylvia, <laughs> and I will have that done by Friday. That's a promise. Okay, uh, the other evening we were out at this place, the Bantai, where my colleague um, had a little minor, a minor uh, incident happen, which meant he left the group and had to be taken to hospital and, and was taken back. And in response to that event, I wrote this. It's called The Stickling Kickling. <laughs> Perhaps it was the kickling that started off the tickling. Perhaps it was the beer that made Bengt feel so queer. While reading an epistle, he couldn't chew the gristle. Selling books in a flurry, he swallowed in a hurry and felt it come to rest in the middle of his chest. Eragut, what have I done? I've ruined all my fun. And now I feel so sick, I probably need a Heimlich. He tried to force it down with beer but nearly drowned. It sprayed across his face through the fingers he had laced. Over his north and south as the froth it bubbled out and down his nose it flew as he staggered to the loo. <laughs> Michelle, I need some help, he whispered through a belch, but the kickling was stuck tight in his pipes and feeling shy. He staggered to the edge and got sick into a hedge. Swing him by the ankle, said Michelle, rubbing her cankles. And as she counted cash, she summoned poor to mash to take off at a dash behind the choking poet who, <coughs> although he didn't know it, was bound for Aixo town to push that kickling down or pull it out and let him shout for beer and fags and crack and let him hurry back. The drugs made him kind of trippy. I am a hairy hippie, said he, pulling off the mask as the doctors did their task <laughs> and removed the stickling kickling and eased the awful tickling. They put it in a jar and sent it off by car to Stockholm without fuss, while Bengti took the bus. Poor Dominic played a blinder and no one could be kinder. He deserves to have a rest in his wife-beating vest and the shoes made by Primark while we sat drinking in the dark. Oh, <laughs> So yeah, the letter to uh, to the king will be of a similar tone, and it will be about uh, the sheer volume of Bernays sauce consumed by the nation, and oh. also uh, about the fact that a Swedish mile is in fact ten kilometres. <laughs> what are you going to do? Can, can can we ask something? Yes. Can I ask something? I have to go. Is that okay? Uh, I wonder. The young people they listen to music, and well, we all do, but. The poetry in the music, I mean, they, they wouldn't sit down with a book and read a poem. Very, very few would. But the poetry in those, like, well, take Beatles. Um, she loves you, yeah, you know, but something else. And we have quite a few here in, in Sweden. They are very popular text and sing-songwriters. Have you ever thought about putting music to anything that you've written? Um, like yeah, I've actually worked with a musician, uh, a pianist uh, who lives in in Paris, and uh, we met at a conference, and you know we were talking, and and in a way that collaborations sometimes arise. He just he said, I really like your poetry, and I think my music would <coughs> go with it, mm -hmm. and so we we started to collaborate for a year with Skype conversations. He's on his boat in Paris. I am in my village in like South India. Mm -hmm. And then we came up with the set and we did three or four live performances, mm -hmm. you know, big grand piano. And, and, and it was it was very lovely because I think music can lift up the words. As a traditional poet, I'd also say that words don't really need they can stand on themselves and and so you don't want to rely too much on i mean i think the great gift of a poet is that with very little material with not much in your pocket you can get up and you know offer your and it is a song in a way but there are so many other wonderful i mean music is just one of them i've also worked with an animation 
group where they ad did an animation of one of the poems. Mm -hmm. I do with my husband little video poems, which is music and video and poem. Okay. So I think I'm all about getting poetry to a wider audience, yeah. and I'm very interested in cross genres. Yeah. So I think a poem can exist in its traditional way, but it's absolutely possible for it to the same poem to exist in many forms. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm always looking for. Yeah any kind of um, you know collaboration that can bring it to a different audience and mm. translation is just one of those mm. collaborations yeah, right. mm. I, I got I got two parts to that question uh, yes I, I, I have always messed about in bands I'm, I'm a wannabe musician really yeah, you're a music, musician uh, well not, not particularly a musician but I was a, uh, I thought uh, every band I've ever been in uh, has, has been I've been the singer uh, and the leader of the band the, the front man if you like and yes I, I've been a lyricist and um, the, the the thing is that I, I really don't believe that um, the, the many uh, lyrics of songs which stand up as poetry. It's, it's very, very few, and it's a totally different discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, the repetition, yeah, right. rhyme. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's very different. I would say the closest thing to poetry you're finding in, in, in modern-day music is rap. And, really? and some, some of that is extraordinarily yeah. good. The yeah. wordplay in there is... Mm -hmm. is it's bonkers good. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. uh, you know, when you, when you think about what they're doing with, with those rhymes, I mean, some of it is horrible. It's yeah. horribly homophobic and sexist and misogynist. And, and misogynist. But some really good rap can, mm. can be mind-blowingly good, you know, in terms of um, verbal usage. Shame Sini was praising Eminem. Was he really? Yeah, yeah. many years who, ago. Who wouldn't? He just said, wow, this guy's got great energy. Yeah, and he said, yeah. wow, a Nobel Prize winning poet who listens yeah, to rap, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. You know? yeah, because it's almost like it's it's like a poem off, isn't it? Mm. They're rhyming to each mm. other. There's a beautiful little girl in Ireland uh, called Elaine, and her, her name is Temperamental Miscellaneous, and she works uh, with this beautiful rap in her own accent, which is kind of Dublin like that, you know. And she does this thing called Colleen Rua with a bow run. And I, it's on YouTube. I suggest you have a look at it. It's really beautiful. Uh, I have um, had done performances with music play behind with a guitar and drums. And it's something I would look for again because I think it takes the heat off the spotlight off you as well if there's more on mm. the stage. It can be a lonely space to inhabit. And as somebody who does a one-woman show, I've actually had a full rock band behind me, obviously mistaking the premise of one woman mm -hmm. should be just me and not a parade of men. But it was <laughs> nice to have the parade of men. You know, I think your chicken, bang chicken or whatever you call it, would be very nice rap. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think, I, I think it would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Something yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank I'm you. glad I could hear you laughing and I yeah. went, away. We met we met the other day, I introduced myself. She saw me photographing birds and I was talking to her and her husband and I still want to get onto their house but maybe <laughs> No pressure now. No pressure. It's up to you now. Houseboat. Hadn't you a boat on the no. lake? We have a boat. The yeah. Houseboat. Houseboat. Oh, okay. Have you got a boat on Sweden? Sweden? Is there any other question for no doubt? Come on, Ulla Gun. No, Tumbleweed nearly just flew by there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, at, last, at last that fly is gone, have you noticed? We scared him off with all the poetry. No, he was only booked for an hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let me say, John Cole, Yowley T, thank you. Thank you all very much for your, for your contributions. Um, thank you, Peter, so much for revealing these poems. <laughs> And finally, when they were asked the, the writers who their inspiration, uh, who their inspirations were, none of them mentioned Dylan Thomas, and that's because they were keeping that a little secret. Uh, because tomorrow night at six o'clock in Tronos Library, um, all our collected residents will be reading some of their favourite po poetry or some of their favourite writing from Dylan Thomas, along with some Didn't of the responses that. or, or words that were influenced by him. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see you at Tronos Library this time tomorrow. Taxi, thank you.